AI because the salaries for PhD <laughs> programmers for the top ones are, are getting well into the million dollars at this stage. I think I've done things wrong in my life, but I'll explain it. Um, thank you for um, having me here this morning. What I want to talk about is the topic of who's going to make money in AI. And this has come about really over the past year and a half, this presentation, where we've had a lot of discussions with people who are really trying to make sense of what's going on with AI. If we look at the media today, the headlines are sensationalist, bombastic, 30% of jobs are going to go, uh, London streets are going to be finally, they're going to be moving quickly because we have autonomous vehicles. And what was clear that is there is a lot of confusion going on with AI. So this presentation is trying to make sense of the dynamics of the industry, where the money is going to be made and, and the value. Um, so myself and actually my colleague over here, Tim Gordon, we set up a practice advisory service called Best Practice AI, which is really working with corporates, um, startups, and financiers to help them accelerate their practical, ethical, and ROI-based AI solutions. And Tim and I bring a combination of about 20 years of digital transformation and experience. I actually have the misfortune or fortune, I got a degree in AI, but it was back in the days when the computational power equivalent, the iPhone, was $50 million, and actually I think it's probably now about $100 million. Um, but my background is really helping companies transform through digital technologies. Um, and then Tim has worked at uh, a number of branded media companies, including the Financial Times, um, Boston Consulting Group, and most recently was uh, CEO of the Liberal Democrats. So we put this organization together because we realized there was a lot of confusion going on in what is AI and how it can actually apply in organizations. So we offer a number of services at the executive level from discovery through planning, execution, and M&A. So the, the history of AI is an interesting one. Um, and it's really a case of, are we ready for another AI gold rush? Back in the 50s, sort of the founding fathers of AI, uh, 50s and 60s, John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, and others, they actually predicted that all the major problems of AI are going to be solved in the next generation. And we kind of missed that. So what we saw in the 60s is there was a, a lot of hype around symbolic AI, rules-based AI. It was going to change the world. 70s, there was a bust. In the UK, there was a, something called the Lighthouse Report that came out in 1972 by the British government that shut down all AI except for two universities, Sussex and Edinburgh. I went to Sussex University degree in AI, not in the 70s. Then in the 80s, the Japanese had a fifth generation project um, that re-put AI back on the map, and there was another boom and another subsequent bust. So the question is, we're now back at an AI boom, everyone's talking about it, is there going to be a bust behind this? And I think the answer is fundamentally no. There is something really different going on today, and that's really the power of exponential. We've had an exponential decrease in the price of comp, comp power, exponential increase in the size of data sets, and an exponential decrease in the cost of software. Softer cost of um, machine learning frameworks such as TensorFlow and, going, and, and so on is zero today. That is amazing. So this is actually driving, I think, what's a wave that will fundamentally mean that AI is going to be woven into the fabric of corporations and societies at this point. Um, now, there's a lot of hype around AI, and so we wanted to understand the question of well, who's actually going to make money in AI? Where's the value going to? So we came up with this model, which we call an industry value map. And we looked at sort of seven layers of who's capturing value here. We started off with the chips and hardware. And you can see a battle going on between chip makers such as NVIDIA, Intel, Google's coming into the game. They're all trying to capture value around the chips. And then the next layer sort of up there, and we see this playing out, is the battle around platform and infrastructure. PaaS, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, basically a cloud battle going on between the big guys at the moment. The Google Clouds, the Amazons, and Microsoft Azures, and so on. And the third level that we see the AI battle playing out at, built on top of the underlying chips and platform, is really starting its frameworks and algorithms, and increasingly we're seeing applications as a service in the cloud. But if you look at Microsoft, Google, Badoo, Facebook, and the like, they're all offering 
their underlying frameworks, algorithms as APIs, so calling TensorFlow, which is now open source. And then on top of that, we're getting APIs that are being built for conversational agents, speech, NLP, core algorithms. And there's a race going on to build the best, um, effectively, cognitive services here. Um, fourth layer we're seeing is the traditional enterprise solutions. If you think of your organizations, you've all probably got a combination of IBM, Oracle, Salesforce, and SOP powering your uh, HR applications, your finance applications, your procurement applications. And there's a battleground going on here for who can have the best enterprise solutions powered by AI. And we keep on going down the stack, and now we're starting to get not only horizontal enterprise solutions, but then the vertical industry solutions. We're finding, um, obviously there's a lot of new suppliers coming into the finance and insurance space, and we'll go through those a little bit later. Agriculture, automotive, all of these verticals have massively well-funded AI companies coming into the space. But then, where most of you are sitting here today is in the corporates. You're sitting on some incredible data assets. Um, you're sitting in terms of massive customer bases, massive brands, massive knowledge of your customers. And you have an opportunity to really leverage AI to improve your businesses today. And then finally, what we're seeing is the battlegrounds playing out in terms of nations. There's something of an arms race going on for which countries will be the leaders of AI and capture value. We see China declaring itself by 2030, it wants to be the leader of AI globally. I'm talking of sums from, ranging from 200 billion to 400 billion going into this. Obviously seeing the UK announcing about a 1 billion pound fund, which is a combination of 300 million in the government and 700 million commitment from enterprise. Uh, US, Germany, China, Israel, France, all <coughs> made very, very big moves here in AI. So this is how we sort of see the battleground playing out for AI and where the value is going to go. So what we see is, is, if we look at the first few layers, if we think of the gold rush, everybody's rushing in trying to dig their, their, their share of gold, but behind all those gold diggers are the picks and shovels companies. And those made the money back in the good old days of the late 19th, 18th century and 19th century. Levi Strauss provided the genes made a fortune. Everybody needed genes in the gold rush. He made a fortune. Uh, those who provided the picks and shovels. And what we see really is the tech giants today, what they're trying to do is really position themselves as the picks and shovels of this gold rush. And their the attitude is, look, at some level they don't really care who's winning in AI, who the winners and losers will be, but they want to make sure they're powering that gold rush. And that's why you see such a focus on the chips, such a focus on the best platform, platform providers out there, and then this race to provide the best frameworks and algorithms. So our general view is the tech giants are playing to win in this space and will be the picks and shovels out there. Take an example here, Microsoft general manager of AI, David Carmona. He said there are 1.2 million developers using our cognitive services, while 300,000 use conversational AI. His point being is there's loads of developers, loads of companies, and they're using our cognitive services, and that's where they want to be. Um, on the enterprise side of things, it's quite interesting. We've seen that there are dominant players in the likes of IBM, Oracle, Salesforce, and SAP, but what's going on is there's a massive amount of money going into funding new upstarts or startups in the enterprise space. Love this company, Digital Genius. Um, they're in the customer management space based here. Um, a couple of young guys in the 20s, really bright, offering really good solutions in the call center environment to help accelerate the productivity of customer service. They've raised $25 million. Zip Recruiter in the HR space, $156 million. And I go down this list, $93 million, $137 million raised by this. RPA, um, UiPath coming out of Romania, backed by Excel in London, has raised $400 million. These are huge sums of money that are going into um, the enterprise space to help create new players here. In the tool space, um, we have Pesun, based in the US, is a set of tools to help enterprises accelerate their 
deployment and management of AI across the enterprise. We've got Sheldon, uh, a flagship leader for deployment tools, um, and solving a problem that is going to be very large, which is when you've got your machine learning models, how do you make sure you've got compliance regulation controls around deploying these models? And as you know, in banking, uh, you can't afford to put a machine learning model into live deployment without some level of control behind it. But we see all this, all this money going in, but the, the, the big guys are not standing still. Salesforce, for example, strengthens its AI capabilities with an 800 million purchase of Datarama. Uh, SAP acquires Recast AI, an NLP company, back in 22nd January. So there's a bit of punch-up going on between the incumbents and the startups in this space. And again, in the vertical space, we're seeing huge amounts of money going into AI power companies. It's great in the UK to see Babylon Health raise 57 million, um, got some of the big names associated with it. A firm, um, which is point of sale credit financing in the US, has raised 720 million. And we go on down the list. And the, the key point is the game of AI is a scale game. Those that get more data get better algorithms, uh, sorry, better output from the algorithms. Better algorithms drive better products and services, gets more customers. And so you get into this sort of virtuous spiral where scale is important. Um, so what about the corporates where most of you sit today? Um, what we did is try to answer this question not from a sort of theoretical perspective, but take a look at what's actually going on today. Not the hype, um, but actually what's going on in corporates today. So we put together our best practice AI library, which is, is available freely on our website, bestpractice.ai. Um, we scanned over 10,000 documents, talked to a lot of people, and we found broadly there's 600 use cases going on for AI today across function and industry. We looked at 850, or curated 850 case studies and across countries, 60 countries. And what we're really trying to do is find out what's really going on as opposed to hype. Um, so feel free to go to, to our site here and take a look through. I mean, one of the questions you were raising earlier is what are the use cases for in the finance sector? Just go in and type finance or explore it. Um, you can look through in the financial sector, you can look at banking, fund and asset management, insurance and so on. And then say in banking, these are the common use cases that we have. And then you click on a use case um, such as analyze the creditworthiness of underbanked individuals. Um, and we will have details about the types of technology involved in this use case, the data required, and some of the benefits. And for all of you who are selling AI to your corporates and your colleagues, it's very important that AI is, is solved not from a technology perspective, but obviously from a business perspective of what KPIs can do. Um, and so we have quite a few case studies as well where we try to put down details of what are the projects, what was the ROI on the project, the data and technology. Um, we actually like some of these from a finance sector perspective. When you're looking at, uh, say, Tala in Africa, it uh, extends loans to 150,000 Kenyans based on their mobile phone data. So it's using the mobile phone data as a signal and a proxy for your credit worthiness. It's a new way of assessing customers. Um, many, many, many case studies and use cases that you can take, take a look on. So to sort of wrap it up, so what we see that's really going on in AI today is everyone talks about the transformation, the smart cities, the autonomous vehicles, but it's actually something a bit more mundane that's going on today. With, um, and AI is being used, what we saw through all these use cases, is really in many respects an extension of data science and big data which is AI, machine learning, deep neural networks being used to predict, optimize, identify, and analyze, and individualize tasks. And this is sort of word cloud of what we were seeing when we looked at all the use cases going on across organizations. So predicting customers of churn, predicting um, customers that are good for credit, um, predicting trades and the like. Um, and what we saw is it was very generally very small, discrete problems that were working very well versus open-ended problems where it's very difficult. So, for example, if you're doing chatbots that can talk about anything, that's an open-ended problem. It doesn't work well. But if you have chatbots that are talking about a limited set of conversations, that works well. Um, so what is clear to us is AI 
is really an enabler. It's a set of tools for everyone in corporate to be able to drive improvement in their, in their processes. Um, and as Jeff Dean of Google Brain said, there are 20 million organizations today that could benefit from machine learning. So we're going to see machine learning explode in the coming years, and we're starting to see that. Um, so in short, what we see is everyone talks about the AI transformation and, re and revolution, but what we think is going on is three phases to the AI journey for corporates. Today, we're really more in the AI power business optimization. How do we improve processes in our organizations? The next phase of AI across the industry is really how do we use AI to enable our products and services? And then the third phase will be corporate transformations. Um, so wrapping up, for, for corporates, we do believe corporates can really win in the AI battle. They sit on phenomenal assets of scale of data, customers, and the like. But the quiet revolution that's going on in AI that will allow business improvements across the organizations is starting now. It's imperative that corporates take a view of how can AI improve my processes across the organization. And organizations start putting in place a portfolio of projects. And what we see is the use cases with high value, clear AI, ROI, that are point solutions that really extend big data projects today with prediction and optimization, are in a constrained problem space, have large quality and historic data sets, clear data signals, um, and make sense on a risk reward spectrum of those to focus on. And the key point is, and I think all of you know this, is making sure that the, the AI projects and portfolio we're working on is getting executive sponsorship without top-down mandate and support, especially of the AI projects that go cross-functioning, you'd be challenged to roll out. Um, so that's it in short. Please do visit our um, website, explore around, and, and give us feedback, and we'd love to chat further. Thank Great you Great so stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're just going to have a bit, any, any questions for Simon, but first up, I think everyone, let's just get up and have a little stretch. Yeah, thank you. Let's move the body. But yeah, if anyone's got any questions, I'm going to start. Um, so you mentioned, um, in terms of like engaging stakeholders, yep. so if I've, got, um, if I've got a use case, you know, I believe in it, yep. and I want to get it, um, and I want to get it approved and engage stakeholders, yep. like, what's some good, good tips? To, to engage stakeholders. Um, the, the most important thing is, is to realize when you're an executive CEO, and as you know, 